Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm INEOS welcome to the champion of the Giro d'Italia, Theo Gegenhardt. <laughs> Hey, what's it been like the last couple of days for you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been been crazy, really. Uh, this was really unexpected. Yeah. Um, everyone you can see in this photo was was so instrumental in that three weeks with some incredible highs, but also some some uh, some lows with with Geraint crashing out, especially. So I don't think anyone in that photo would have uh, would have predicted this, um, but here we are and yeah it's been been an incredible three weeks a good metaphor for for this year i think perseverance and and just keeping on going and uh focusing on on the little things like we did on our lap of italy and uh yeah it's amazing how much it means to to the people that you see in that video and, and yeah. many others as well at what point over that last three weeks particularly over the last week did you actually think for the first time, you know, I might be able to do this? I guess there wasn't one clear moment um, in a race that's three and a half thousand kilometers and 21 days. Uh, I think it was around 85 hours of yeah. racing total. And we came into the last day tied on time, which um, I'm led to believe is the first time ever in the history of the sport um, that a race like this has been decided by such a fine margin coming into the last day um, there was never one kind of clear moment it was a kind of case of getting closer and closer and yeah we we nicked it on the last day which um, which was pretty special um, but it was kind of just a constant reassessing of what our goal was um, obviously we went in with Geraint and then on the third day uh, in Sicily, uh, we were finishing on the top of Mount Etna um, and Geraint crashed and we, we changed completely the mentality of, team, of the team and the goal. And I was kind of just creeping my way up the, the classification of the race and we kept just kind of re renewing what our, our hopes and, and dreams and ambitions as a team were. And, we won seven of the 21 days uh, along the way and, and uh, we just really kept that ball rolling. It's, maybe it's a bit of a cliche momentum and you know, once something good starts happening, it just keeps going. But uh, I can tell you that was exactly what happened and it was really special to be a part of. Yeah, my, teams, the team's best ever performance, seven stage wins and the overall. Pretty yeah, and we just had this incredible uh, mentality is you know we we were talking actually in the bus quite a few days about uh this kind of grenadier spirit that we as a team want to try and create yeah. um and i guess something like that intangible you you can speak about it but you don't really know what it is it's kind of a case of stepping back and now in hindsight saying that was what it is that's that is what we want to take forward and the way that we raced i think we haven't really raced like that as a team before. Yeah. People have asked me what the best part of the last 48 hours has been. And definitely one of the best parts has been a lot of people I've spoken to and, and journalists who often are you know, a bit more on the pessimistic side of, of, of the world um, have said it was a fun race to watch. Mm. And they don't often, I've never heard that before, to be honest. Mm. So. Yeah, I think that's something new for our team. Yep. And um, in the end, we're trying to entertain people as much as win and, and all our other objectives. And for me, that's fulfilling, I think, especially after this year. I don't want to keep saying that, but you know, everything that's happened for me personally, I was seven and a half, eight weeks locked in the apartment with my poor girlfriend, um, <laughs> counting every week that we were excited to go to the supermarket and what flavor of ice cream we were going to get and all yeah. the rest of it. Yeah, well, I, you've given us all a fantastic three weeks. We've been glued and it's been brilliant. I mean, the bare minimum was to hold the wheel. Um, we'd said that going into that stage, if I finished in the same scenario, so 15 seconds down on Kelderman and 13 seconds down on, on Hinley, that that wouldn't be the end of the world. We'd still be with him with a shout. That was our, our minimum. Um, 
Kelderman had been dispatched by the incredible performance of my teammate Rowan Dennis. He'd blown the race to smithereens for the second time in three days. Um, so it was one guy to focus on. We knew Kelderman was over a minute behind us on the road from the from the earpiece that we that we race with. Um, so it was just a case of, of focusing on him. I was really focused on winning the stage. I knew that those time bonuses would be really important. Um, and I really wanted to win because of the performance my my teammates had done. We'd won so much throughout the race. I think before that day, we'd won five stages of a possible 19. Um, but it was the first time we'd taken the race on, imposed ourselves upon the race in the sense of riding the front, everyone behind us. That The furthest I was in the, in the peloton, in the group of cyclists that day was fifth or sixth person out of 150 guys. So we were all day in the front controlling the race. We spoke on the bus in the morning about how we wanted the race to look like. And it's more or less exactly how the race can be seen on, on television. And I can tell you from my three or four years as a professional cyclist, that doesn't happen very often. Um, this sport is inherently chaotic and unpredictable. And, and uh, yeah, I was just really focused on, on winning the stage. Um, I was feeling super confident. I was smiling all day. It was a beautiful day. These like bronzy autumn mm. colors that my girlfriend absolutely loves was next to us all day kind of going up from Turin up to the mountains and uh, yeah, I was thinking about her and just feeling I was feeling happy to be honest um, and I just wanted to make the most of the of the opportunity it's you know once in a lifetime opportunity so I was focused yeah. <laughs> Pete Williams assures me that your performance on the last time is all down to his coaching on that time trial Definitely. last year without so. doubt without <laughs> doubt I always think that knowledge is, is power in most situations and knowing more about your competition is, is of course helpful. Um, in cycling it maybe gets overlooked a little bit because there's some races we start with 220 riders on the, on the start line so it's pretty difficult to know maybe all 220 from a, a group of eight, 900 professional cyclists. Um, but I definitely think that the more I can know, the better. So I try to, you know, keep as up to date as I can on riders' performances and, and uh, results. Um, specifically, the, the two or three guys that were uh, behind me on GC, I know uh, the second place pretty well. It's a guy I've grown up with. Uh, he's a Western Australian um, called Jai Hindley. We've definitely raced together at least for the last four or five years. So he's the same age as me. We actually chat quite a bit um, off the bike. He has the same brand of coffee machine as me, so we often <laughs> send each other uh, links from this Facebook group about uh, coffee machines. Um, so yeah, I know him pretty well. Um, and yeah, I think within cycling, everyone more or less knows each other's characteristics and definitely within a Grand Tour, um, everyone is constantly sussing out each other's level and trying to take anything they can from the most insignificant of, uh, of events as something to know about their opposition. So, yeah, I guess cycling's a bit different from maybe boxing or, or football where you can really analyse the opponent, but um, I try my best. <laughs> I've always tried my absolute best to have as good relationship as possible with, with every rider that I race against. Um, it's not always possible. There's moments where things happen and things are said and that's racing um, I think you have to be cutthroat in some moments but I try to respect everyone and hope that they'll reciprocate that respect back to me really and I think definitely in our sport it uh, it comes back to you when you treat people well I think you might give someone two inches extra space because you know they really need to get there for their leader or they really need that inch and it will come back to you even if it's a few years down the line. Um, most of us spend our whole careers working for other riders and certainly have done plenty of that um, as a professional. And that's when you really notice who treats each other well and, and who doesn't. Um, I think the biggest thing for me about this victory has been to receive praise and, and congratulations from colleagues on other teams. It, also within the team, of course, is amazing, but 
to have messages from from rivals and and other teams uh, is really special. I think just to to feel that from from other riders that they're happy for you is really nice because we do battle each other for 80 90 di days a year um but i think cycling's a pretty good sport for that there's a you know we train together often into team this year with covid not so much but we'll go out riding with a guy and three days later we'll be bashing arms with him at 50 60 mile an hour down some descent all trying to get into a wet corner first so that's the nice thing about cycling and I'll just try and stay the same and uh, I hope everyone will treat me the same to be honest. Um, I'm sure someone will cut me up within 10 seconds of the first race, so <laughs> that's bike racing. Um, tactics wise, Jai had every right to, to sit on. Um, you know, I always say you choose your tactics and it's up to your opposition to adjust their tactics to, to um, to try and win, uh, considering what they know about what you're doing. I think um, he sat on that day and won the sprint and he won his first Grand Tour stage. So congratulations to Jai. Um, I just had to ride my race really and, and just try and focus on myself. And I think there's so many unspoken rules in cycling um, and people often expect someone to work just because that's the good thing to do or the right thing to do but um, in the end of the day he's you know got his plan with his team and his teammate was two minutes down the road fighting to try and take the race lead which he in the end did by a meager 15 seconds so yeah I mean I'm sure everyone can look at races in hindsight and say oh someone should have done this and that I know yesterday when I was in the car with my girlfriend I was saying oh maybe I should have done that in that moment and I should have done this then and she was laughing at me saying well doesn't really matter but uh, you know we've got another Giro next year and another 80 days of racing so I'm always trying to improve and uh, and learn on that and improve my tactics also yeah he might have had you on the Stelvio but it must have been nice to get him back on Sestrio two days later yeah definitely that was big motivation to on the Stelvio Rowan did an incredible performance yeah. um, and I really wanted to win for him there um, I was two metres short or yeah. a metre and a half short after six hours of racing. Yeah. So there was even more at stake on uh, on Sestria. Yeah. Um, the, the gaps were even even smaller. And yeah, with, with the race, it's 10, six and four bonus seconds when you cross the finish line. Um, so yeah, as I was sprinting, I was thinking, you know, the Giro could come down to this sprint. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, what, a, what no better motivation in the world, really. There was kind of a a background uh, goal, I guess, yeah, for me to stay in the hunt and just see what happened and, and play the long game, um, which suited me because even if I did want to purely focus on the individual days of the race rather than the, the general classification, um, the second half was always better for me anyway. So it was always about being patient regardless. Um, but when G crashed, we basically sat on the bus with, with Dave B, uh, the team principal, the, the next day. And we said, you know, this is an opportunity of a lifetime for, for seven guys that had come to the race with the sole purpose of, of trying to help Geraint. Um, you can now race free. You, you can embody any spirit you like. Why not choose the one of being aggressive, going out on the front foot, making the breakaways, in a lot of ways doing everything that we didn't do uh, in the in the first years of this team we were you know going from kilometer zero every day breaking the race to smithereens um, winning stages left right and center it felt like at times and cycling is a really complicated sport to understand um, but we kind of left behind our, our old mentality and just threw caution to the wind essentially and just woke up every day and said this is our day we're going to try even if it's not going to work, we're still going to try. And we had two or three second places, a few third and fourth places. You know, it didn't go perfectly every day, um, but we won seven of the 21 stages on the GC. So it wasn't the plan, uh, but it, it turned out all right in the end. And here we are. Yep. A time trial is all about you. There's so much less external factors than racing in a, in a group of cyclists of 150 guys with crazy descents and 
corners you've never seen before that you enter at 20 miles an hour too much and, and all the rest of it. A time trial, you ride the morning of the race, you know the course, you know your pacing strategy, and in the end of the day, it's about how, how you feel and, and what you can do, and, and you control your own destiny in that sense. Um, I really felt quite calm. There was about an hour and a half after I had my pre-race meal, um, which is about three and a half hours before the race, where I was sat in the, in the hotel room in Milan. Um, and that was the only time I felt kind of nervous, really. Um, just, yeah, being on my own, kind of playing a little bit and not really having anything to do other than wait. Um, and I just turned my phones off and put some music on and just tried to relax. Um, and after that, it was just going through the process. Uh, it's something I've done so many times. Um, since I very first started cycling, age 14 or 15. Um, and yeah, I had all the team and all of you guys, all of our sponsors, everything. But in the end of the day, the, the only person I could really let down was myself for, for not taking that opportunity. Um, and I felt great, so it was good. <laughs> and I just got stuck in, to be honest. I had a, I had a great first kilometer. It was quite technical, the start of the TT. Um, a few tight corners and there's a good feeling when you just nail a corner. Um, I think anyone can find that in a car or a bicycle or even running maybe. You know that no one else can take that corner quicker than you've taken it and that just gives you again that momentum. It's a good metaphor for how we approach the whole race. You you know, you know, start your day well and it just keeps, keeps going and it was 18 minutes and uh, this at the end, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was listening on the uh, TV coverage and uh, Brad Wiggins was, uh, was pretty vocal uh, and basically saying that uh, he is a huge fan of yours and now his boy looks to you as his cycling hero. How does that feel? Uh, yeah, it's bizarre really for me. Um, I think I'm in such a privileged position that there was all these amazing sporting superstars, Patrick Vieira, prime example I was 10 years old watching the Invincibles as a massive Arsenal fan um, and I know the effect that sport can have on someone's life even if they don't become a professional you know I think it can be life-changing whether you're 10 years old or 60 years old there's people that discover a new passion all the time and and you know find renewed health and, and fitness every day and um, yeah, Bradley really inspired me with, with what he did in, in 2012. Um, and pretty much from, from that moment on, I was dreaming of, of riding for this team. You know, our, our, our look has changed. We have different tactics now, apparently, and we're racing in a different way. But yep. it, it was always a dream for me to, to be a professional cyclist and, and to ride for this team especially. And yeah, to have people like uh, Bradley Wiggins and. Chris Hoy sent me a super nice message um, before the time trial, kind of saying well done is, is something really bizarre for me to be honest um, and, and uncomprehensible in some ways. But uh, yeah, I'm just happy that someone like Bradley Sun can, uh, can be excited about the sport and, and have something to, yeah, to, to feel energy about and to watch and go out hopefully on his bike and, and, uh, and smash it as well. What would you say to the 14-year-old who bunked off school to ride in behind the team at the launch? Uh, I should have taken some thicker gloves because I was so excited that morning. It was freezing in January on the mall. And uh, I actually had to stop at the bike shop uh, in Holborn that I was working Saturday mornings at, or Saturdays at, to, uh, to warm up on the way home because I was in tears, so cold. So <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best piece of advice, Absolutely. thicker gloves. Teo, thank you very much for everything you've given to us over the last three weeks and, and for coming along today and sharing it with us. Yeah. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you all for the, for the support. <laughs>